Hello. It is almost the new year, so it's time to start making some resolutions. And one of my favorite challenges that I like to set for myself is to read or reread some classic books because some of these titles I have read before, but a really long time ago, back in school or at university when I felt like I had to read them. But this reading list isn't about must. It's not about, oh, I feel so guilty. I haven't read this classic book. No, it's about the pleasure of reading and the joy of discovery because that's what classic books are about. So I've set myself 12 books to read in 2024. That's one a month. It should be manageable. And a lot of these have a special anniversary attached to them, or there's a particular reason why I want to read them. So I'm going to discuss why I'm so eager to read these particular titles. And I'd love to hear if you have read any of these books and what you think about them, or if you want to join me in reading any of these books, that would be really great. So let me know about that. Or if there are any other classic books that you want to read in 2024, please let me know. To start off, we are going back 200 years to January 9th, 1824. That was the birthday of English novelist and playwright Wilkie Collins. Now, I read Wilkie Collins's The Moonstone for the very first time a couple of years ago, and it was such a pleasure to read the way he creates characters and very funny and but also tense scenes and the the way he creates such a sense of atmosphere is so wonderful that I want to read more of his work and I've never read The Woman in White. I meant to read it this past autumn because it felt like a very autumnal read but I just didn't get around to it. So this novel begins very dramatically of a man meeting in the street, a woman dressed all in white who is very mysterious mysterious and lost and then he finds out she escaped from an asylum. So in this story, he melds this gothic sensibility with psychological realism to tell a riveting story that's told from a number of different characters' points of view. And this story is also one of the prototypes of the modern detective novel. And so it veers between uh, the city of London and English country estates and an insane asylum. Asylum. So it sounds like such an immersive story. Then we are going back 150 years to November 1874. That is when Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy was first published, and it was a popular and critical success. It's known as one of the greatest love stories of all time. It centers around Bathsheba Everdeen, is she a relative of Katniss Everdeen from Hunger Games? No, no, probably not. <laughs> but she has many suitors who all vie for her attention, and she struggles to maintain her independence amidst all of this attention from so many gentlemen. And it is about her story of passion and jealousy and unrequited love. I read uh, Tess of the D'Urbervilles a long time ago, and I've been wanting to read more Thomas Hardy. And this is meant to be one of his all-time greats. Then I have a few novels which were first published a hundred years ago in 1924, starting with A Passage to India by E. M. Forrester, which I did read a really long time ago, but pretty much all that I remember about it is the tagline of what really happened to Miss Quested in the Marabar Caves, because it follows the story of this British schoolmistress who goes to visit some caverns in India with a doctor. Dr. Aziz, and she accuses him of sexually assaulting her, and he's arrested for that. So it's about the drama of this trial and the question of her memory, but it's really about the racial tensions and prejudices which existed between the Indians and the British during this colonial era of the 1920s and a movement for Indian independence. And this is known as one of the greatest novels written in English of all time. It is so good that Forster stopped publishing any other novels uh, in his lifetime. Also first published in 1924 is The Homemaker by Dorothy Canfield Fisher, and this is known as a very thought-provoking novel that 
challenged gender roles at the time because it follows a family where the father has an accident which leaves him disabled, so he stays at home to raise the children, and the mother goes to work at a department store to earn money to support the family. The author Carol Shields was a fan of this novel, and she said it is a remarkable and brave novel. I was astonished at the acute angle of vision and the fullness of sympathy towards both men and women and children. And I was partly inspired to pick up and buy and read this book because it's been published in this beautiful Persephone edition. If you don't know Persephone books, they they publish their books in these beautiful dove gray covers. But this comes with a Norman Rockwell uh, painting on the cover of A Child Reading, which is just such a beautiful scene. And also first published in 1924 is The Magic Mountain by Thomas man. This story begins a decade before the First World War following a man who was an orphan who was raised by his grandfather and just as he's setting out in his adult life he goes to visit a sickly cousin of his who's staying in a sanatorium in Davos high up in the Swiss Alps but there he comes down with an illness himself and the doctors convince him to stay and his stay gets extended for years and years, and there he meets a number of different characters, so it's about all their different personalities and interactions with each other, but they also represent a microcosm of pre-war Europe, so it's about this bygone era, and I am so keen to read this novel partly because I have a story um, behind this location, this sanatorium set high up in the Swiss Alps because I went to Switzerland for the first time earlier in 2023 and we went on a car journey there. We rented a car and we were driving around the Swiss Alps, went to Davos and saw that this hotel that apparently inspired Thomas Mann to write this novel, or partly inspired him to write it, was just there. So we thought, oh, why don't we go see this hotel while we're there? So I went on Google Maps, found a route, and it took us like up this mountain, up this path, around a mountainside, which got increasingly narrow. And because uh, it was right on the cliffside and going around curves, there really wasn't any way for us to like back up and get out. And the road kept getting narrower and narrower. We went, went over this rickety bridge, which I was so afraid was going to collapse. We finally emerge out into a wider road with such relief. And there is a Swiss woman who is walking her dog, just staring at us and shaking her head back and forth. And I said, I got out of the car and I was like, oh, was this not a road? And she's like, no, that is a hiking path. And the police, if the police found you there, you would have been fined a lot. So I have this stuck in my mind and we never went to this hotel. So I do want to read this novel now and find out about this location in a fictional context. But that's a lesson for you never to just trust Google Maps blindly. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. On to the next novel, We by Eugene Zamiatin. This was first published in an English translation in 1924, even though the author was Russian, but it wasn't published in Russian until a few decades later in 1952. And that's because it's about power and control and surveillance and rebellion, so it was a bit too much of a hot topic at the time. It's about a perfect society called One State, which is overseen by the benefactor, and everyone lives in harmony as long as they follow the rules. And one engineer is an ideal citizen until he meets another person who tips him off about love and passion and independence. So this influenced so many other authors who wrote their own dystopian fiction, like George Orwell and Margaret Atwood, who wrote an introduction to this book, this new edition of it, which was a new translation of it, which uh, came out a few years ago. And I did read this a really long time ago, but again, I don't remember all that much about it. And I'm sure I'll appreciate it much more now that I'm a bit older. On August 2nd, 1924, one of the greatest American authors ever was born. 
James Baldwin. So I want to reread his classic, Giovanni's Room. This is a story of an American man who's in Paris with his girlfriend. His girlfriend goes off on a trip and while she's away, he meets an Italian man named Giovanni and they fall for each other. So it's a pioneering work about bisexuality, about issues to do with masculinity and social isolation and sexuality. It is such a great work of literature and I can't wait to revisit it. I also just noticed in this copy I have uh, that I tucked away a ticket for If Beale Street Could Talk um, when it first came out in cinemas and that is a novel that I also love. On June 3rd, 1924, only at the age of 40, Franz Kafka died, so I want to read his novella Metamorphosis about a salesman who wakes up one morning to find that he is transformed into a large insect. So it's about him adjusting to this new way of life. And I've never read this novella. It's only 80 pages long, but I have this Penguin Classics edition, which comes with a lot of his most famous short stories. And I've read some of his short stories before, like The Hunger Artist, but I've been wanting to read more. So I'm looking forward to reading this entire book. 50 years ago, in 1974, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard was first published, and it's difficult to describe what this nonfiction book is about because Dillard reflects on writing and solitude and religion. It's sometimes called a nature book because she also makes scientific observations about the immediate world around her house. But apparently Dillard doesn't like calling it a nature book. She prefers to call the book of theology. I had a copy of this and I think I must have lent it out to somebody because I can't find it on my shelves, um, even though I have all of these other books by Dillard uh, available. But I read Pilgrim at Tinker Creek for the first time many years ago, and I've been wanting to revisit it because I just remember falling in love with it. In 1974, Look at the Harlequins by Vladimir Nabokov was first published, and this was Nabokov's final novel, and it all becomes a bit self-conscious because the story is about a writer named Vadim and his four wives and the books he writes, and the life of this character blurs a bit with Nabokov's own life. Um, I have not read this book yet. I had this mission a long time ago because he wrote a lot of novels that I would read all of his books in the order that he read them. And I think I made it through three or four four before I jumped ahead to his most famous book, Lolita, because I got impatient. So it'll be, be kind of interesting now to go to his final novel and then work back from there to read his other works. Also in 1974, the pioneering satirical novel Oreo by Fran Ross was first published. This is a story about a girl born into a taboo relationship between a Jewish father and a black mother. She she never knew her father because her parents separate when she's only two years old. She's mostly raised by her maternal grandparents because her mother joins a theatrical troupe. But when she comes of age, she goes on a journey to try to find her father. It's described as a picaresque tale and also a story that plays upon the structure of the Greek myth thesis. I'm so curious to read this novel, which has become a kind of cult classic because it didn't do well at all when it first came out. And it's seen now as kind of ahead of its time on the way it looks at race and belonging. On March 7th of this year, an Italian classic is going to be published in English for the very first time. That is her Side of the Story by Alba de Suspedes. This is translated into English by Jill Foulston, and it comes with an afterword by Elena Ferrante. So this novel was first published in Italian in 1949. It's about a woman recalling her life growing up in Rome in the 1930s during the rise of fascism, and about how the lives of women during that time were very constricted by housework and romantic 
romantic longing, but she wanted to find her own independence and forge her own path in life. But the more independence she found, the more resistance she received to it. So it's about that struggle. And Suspedes is an Italian writer that I feel like the English speaking world is just discovering for the first time because her work is being brought out in English for the very first time. And so I read her novel Forbidden Notebook, um, which was published uh, in 2023. And it was one of the best books that I read this year. It's such an incredible story, so well structured, so insightful, so much tension, such great characters that I just fell in love with it. So I'm so excited to read more of her work. And finally, on April 11th of this year in the UK, James by Percival Everett is going to be published. And this is so intriguing because this is Percival Everett's take on the character of Jim from the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. So in preparation for this retelling of this book, I want to read the original classic by Mark Twain, which is the story of Huck who runs away from his abusive father and he runs into Jim, who's a slave um, who overheard that he's going to be sold. Um, so he runs away with Huck and they go on a journey down the Mississippi River and the story follows that. And I think I read an abridged version of this book when I was at school. I think it must have been shorter than the actual novel. So I'm so eager to go back and read the full thing now. And I'm fully expecting there to be quite a few dated things in this. And also that um, the character of Jim probably um, has more aspects of him which Percival Everett is seizing upon and then retelling this story from a whole new perspective on. And I'm so up for this kind of retelling, having um, this year um, read Julia by Sandra Newman, which is her retelling of George Orwell's 1984. And it is so fascinating where she takes that story and that character, who's really a side character in the story, but it really becomes her own tale. And I think Percival Everett is going to do the same thing with James. So, so eager to read this book and all of these other books. And like I said, I would love it if you joined me on this journey of reading some or all of these classics over the course of 2024. But I'd also be eager to hear your thoughts about any of these books, which you think I should prioritize over others, or if there are other classics that you're looking forward to reading through this year and that you have set yourself as a resolution, please let me know about that. But I hope you're doing well and reading good things and have a wonderful new year and I will speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.